On the night of September 19th, 1961, on a remote highway in New Hampshire, Betty and Barney Hill were abducted. The nature of this abduction has been the topic of numerous post-investigations and documentaries, even fictionalized accounts, because supposedly on that night and leading into the next morning, the Hills were abducted by aliens, which came from a UFO. And they did things to the hills to take away their memories. They did things to their car, did things that left a lasting impression that resulted in Betty Hill suffering from intense and very realistic dreams in the week following the event and led to both of them suffering from a form of PTSD for the rest of their lives. This event, this abduction that supposedly took place in New Hampshire, was an event that popularized a type of alien, which we've come to, in many cases, refer to as the greys, because they are little aliens, usually humanoid, so they have two arms, two legs, a head, a torso, but they're smaller and maybe have different joints, maybe three to four feet tall, sometimes taller, but typically much smaller, usually quite lean, even skeletal, They have big heads, large black eyes, no visible genitalia or hair or ears or noses. It's the popular version of what you think of when you think of an alien. Maybe not green, but this gray version is where that all stemmed from. This event in particular is what led to a lot of the pop culture fascination with this style of alien, this species of alien, if you will. And so these greys, sometimes also referred to as the Roswell greys, because they are considered to be the same species that crash-landed in Roswell, New Mexico, or the Zeta Reticulans, because of a dream that Betty had where she remembered during the abduction seeing a book which showed the view of Earth and our solar system from the standpoint of the alien's star system, and then... Tracing it backward, she herself being an amateur astronomer, she deduced that these aliens were from the star system of Zeta Reticuli. And so, Greys, Roswell Greys, Zeta Reticulans, whatever you call them, these became the iconic alien that we think of when we think of aliens. And 43% of reported alien encounters within the U.S. describe this type of alien. They describe the greys, though what each individual abductee calls this alien differs. They don't say the greys or the zeta reticulans. They say it was an alien, or they say it was a demon, or they say it was an angel, or they say it was a machine, depending on their personal belief system. Their perception of the abduction differs, but the description stays relatively constant. And there are some interesting and plausible, shockingly plausible, particularly if you've never looked deep into abduction stories, shockingly plausible aspects to this particular instance. There was lost time that was unaccounted for, about three hours that neither of them could remember. And they didn't find out about this, seemingly, until later. There were unexplained scrapes on their shoes. There was the matter of a torn binocular strap. There were circular marks on the back of the car that seemed to be magnetized. And under hypnosis later, they began to fill in the blanks. The hills began to fill in the blanks for how some of these things happened. The strap being torn as... Barney Hill ran back to his car, and the circles being imprinted on the car by a kind of vibration wave shot from the UFO as they drove away. And then there's the star map that Betty remembers from her dream from the week after the abduction that seems to line up shockingly well with what the night sky would look like from Zeta Reticuli, the star system that these aliens are supposedly from. Now, on the other hand, like with so many abduction stories, there is also a great deal of skepticism warranted. 
these little gray aliens, this description of this type of alien, was not completely new. It was not something that the hills, as far as we can tell, made up. It's not something that they saw first. H.G. Wells described very similar gray little skeletal aliens in several of his works, including in his very famous book, War of the Worlds, in which this species of little gray alien was brought down as a food species for the invader species. There's also First Men in the Moon, where the Selenites, which were the inhabitants of the moon, looked very similar to what the hills described. And then there was an article that H.G. Wells wrote, a nonfiction article about the future of humanity, entitled Man of the Year Million. And in it, he describes what humanity would look like in the future, and he describes something very similar to the greys. Now, all of these writings were from the late 19th century into the early 20th century, roughly the 1890s up until the early 1900s, 1901, 1902. But more contemporary of the supposed abduction, the TV show The Outer Limits played an episode that featured an alien that looked a whole lot like what Barney and Betty Hill described later. And less than a decade before that, there was a very popular film entitled Invaders from Mars, which likewise featured aliens that in some ways matched the description of the greys. In the years since then, the stories that Barney and Betty tell, which initially didn't sync up in every particular, and in fact Betty remembered a whole lot more than Barney, and then Barney later changed his story to match up with hers, and a lot of the stories that did come out came out under hypnosis. But Betty later began to see a lot of UFOs. She started to see them everywhere. And this apparently ran in the family. Her sister, before the supposed abduction, also told Betty that she saw a UFO. But Betty herself began to see them everywhere. And in fact, when a reporter went out with her on one of her UFO vigils that she would go on regularly to go try to see or maybe even contact the UFOs, the reporter found that Betty was unable to distinguish between a landed UFO and a streetlight. She was seeing UFOs everywhere she looked. Now, hearing this story, and depending on your worldview, you might choose one set of data or the other to give more credence, to give more weight. It's likely that you're pulled in one direction or the other based on past experience or based on your preconceived notions about UFOs and aliens, maybe about people who lived back in the 60s and their gullibility and their lack of knowledge about modern technology that we have today. Or maybe it's a preconceived notion about people who see UFOs everywhere, or a latent backing for stories that do seem to have some physical evidence that is unexplained. Whatever the case, very few people are staunchly in the middle in a case like this. It's either, yes, clearly there have been abductions and we need to do more research into this and figure out if somebody's covering up the data so that the public doesn't know about it, or no, these are clearly unwell or delusional or well-meaning but wrong people who want to see something so much that they have convinced themselves that they have. And this isn't just true of aliens and UFOs, this default lack of a middle ground. It's the case with most things. I would argue increasingly so it is the case with most things. We've entered an age where spectrums are being pulled more taut, and the only acceptable place to be is on one side or the other. There's less and less support for ideas that are in the middle, positions that are in the middle, in that gray area, between the two extremes that claim they have absolute certitude, that claim they have truth on their side. And that's what I want to talk about today. Not just the alien greys. I'll probably do an episode on aliens at some point, but not today. Today I want to talk about the greys between black and white, and the ever-increasing contrast that is keeping us from seeing them. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Now, the article that I want to start from today is one of many 
background articles published by The Economist and other British and European news magazines during the lead-up to the Brexit vote. Now, the Brexit, for those of you who either haven't been paying attention or just don't care, or never took the time to properly understand it, which is definitely understandable. The Brexit was a vote that most people within the establishment of British politics did not want to happen. Essentially, what it was was a referendum vote, which meant that it's non-binding. It's something that Cameron, who was the prime minister until recently, said that he would do so that a further right community of British politics would vote for him. And so he said, if you guys vote for me, I know you guys are separatists. You don't want to be part of the EU. You want the UK to stand alone, separate from the EU. I don't want that. But if you vote for me, then I will put it to a vote. I'll let the country decide. And whatever they decide will stand. Now, legally, that's not the case. Legally, there was no reason that it had to stand, except that he'd given his word. But in any case, he said that he would have the referendum vote. And he did. And against all odds, and I, I do not use that superfluously, like against all of the odds that were being cast about this vote, nobody thought that it would pass. And it did. And everybody was shocked. I was actually in London when this happened. And the look on people's faces as I walked by them that morning when they realized what had happened, because the final votes were calculated at about 2 a.m. local time, it was just stunning. Everybody looked stunned. And I felt stunned too. And I had only just learned about what was happening. But essentially what the Brexit meant was that the UK would separate from the EU, from the European Union, and would go off on their own. And they would create all their own trade deals. And they would no longer have to adhere to European standards. They'd no longer be part of that bigger collection. They would be a largely independent nation again. And so that was very exciting to a certain portion of the population. And it was thought by most thought leaders that that part of the population was small and radical. And so a vote would put it all to rest. They, they got to have their say, and it was clear that the country didn't want it to happen. And so then they were free to move on without these radicals bothering them anymore. But that turned out not to be the case, and the Brexit passed. And Cameron stepped down from his position as prime minister. And even some of the people who promoted the Brexit, who wanted it to happen, some of them because they were true believers and some of them because they used it as a politically opportune time to take some power, they stepped down too. They stepped away. They recognized that it was going to be a difficult thing and anything that they did would be a great big blemish on their political record, whether they decided to invoke Article 50, which is essentially the part of the agreement for the EU that says, if you want to leave, invoke this article, and then we have two years to negotiate our divorce. And so that hasn't, as of recording at least, that has not been invoked yet. And nobody has done it because to do so is to potentially break up the UK. There's evidence that Scotland would want to break off from the UK. And Ireland potentially would reunify and break away from Britain as well and join the EU. And so whoever does this potentially is the person who breaks up the United Kingdom, which would be a great big deal. But a, a big part of why this is so fascinating and remarkable is not just because it could be the swan song, the death knell of what was once the dominant superpower on the planet. But because of how unusual something like this is historically, it's the breaking up of a country, potentially, or at least the, the dissolution of an incredibly big alliance, one of the most important alliances that exists on the planet today, through such a strange and underdog-like referendum. The fact that it passed is, is a big part of why it's so surprising, because everybody was absolutely certain that it would not there's no way there's enough crazy hardliners, they thought, to get something like this through. But it turned out there was, and it turned out that perhaps it wasn't as hardline a position as they thought. And I think what caught them by surprise is that, according to their demographic information, 
most people were so firmly in the middle on something like this that they wouldn't dare vote for something so dramatic. Yes, a lot of people, particularly in rural areas and in Wales, were not particularly fond of the agreements and the standards that were instilled and enforced by being in the union. But at the same time, it wasn't such a big deal that they would do something so dramatic about it, something that could have such incredible negative consequences. You'd have to be a real hardliner to do that, a real true believer. And the establishment on both sides, the conservative and liberal parties, Labour and the Tories, did not believe that there were enough hardliners to make this happen. And this is kind of a microcosm of something that is happening all over the world right now. It's unusual historically to have so many hardliners behind something so dramatic, but it's not that unusual if we look in the current context. And the current context is that we are seeing an incredible move away from middle-of-the-road ideology. We are seeing a degradation of all of the gradients of gray between black and white. We're seeing, in essence, an increase in contrast. And what that means is essentially people on the black and the white, using those colors to delineate extremes, not any political affiliation or race or anything like that, but people on the black and the white are shining lights on each other and shining lights on the playing field in which they are standing off against each other. And in doing so, increasing the brightness of the white and the darkness of the black and wiping out all of the grays that exist in between them. Typically, you go from black to white, and you get a gradient. There's kind of like dark gray, and lighter gray, and lighter gray, and lighter gray, until you get to white. Those grays are disappearing. It's very much a with-us-or-against-us situation with a lot of these ideologies. And you see this in politics. You see it in religions. You see it in different regions, be those countries or states or cities or townships. I mean, we're seeing it on every level because this is something that is valuable for many different reasons to instill in people. It's valuable to increase that contrast so that you also increase the perceived identity and the labels that people adhere to themselves so that they have that feeling of belonging. And this leads then to the rise of authoritarian politicians and many situations in which the establishment is being forced to face off against potential usurpers for the first time. Those usurpers, for the first time in a very long time, have finally congealed into a counterparty against the main established parties in certain political circumstances. We're seeing an increasing slant within punditry. We are seeing here in the U.S., the example that I would use are things like Fox News, which is a very, very conservative propaganda channel. And then we're seeing the opposite happen on the other side, where we see MSNBC move left, we see Huffington Post. And then that, in turn, leads to more conservative voice boxes like Breitbart, which then leads to Mother Jones. And so we see the left versus right thing become more and more amplified. It's like a cold war where both sides are building up their arsenals and building and building and building to the point where there's no resources left in the middle. Everything has been turned into bombs on one side or the other. And so these things that I just listed are the consequence of this. It's the consequence of this increased contrast between black and white that leads to these incredibly antagonistic and kind of opposite political parties that we're seeing everywhere. And it's what leads to the establishment versus usurper dynamic. And it's what leads to this increased slant within our quote-unquote journalism. But it's also the result of those things. As we start to identify ourselves more strongly with these different groups and start to define ourselves using these labels that are very us versus them, then we start to think more that way as well. We begin to think in extremes as opposed to thinking in grays. An example of this is that here in the United States in this election season, it's very difficult to find somebody who does not identify themselves as a Democrat or a Republican, or increasingly as one of the third party candidates, supporters. And in some cases, actually Bernie Sanders as well, people who are the usurpers versus the establishment. 
And so you've got these major players and you've got these well-defined lines in the sand and you're not going to find too many people who are saying, well, I agree with this politician on this and this politician on this. And I think that political party has a pretty good idea with this, but that's a deal breaker. So I would prefer this party for economics or, or whatever. You don't really find that. For a long while, you did. That was the idea of politics. The idea was to build these partnerships between parties, to build these coalitions so that you could get things done. That's how you would get enough people supporting you to support some individual bill or whatnot that you cared about. But today, the idea is black versus white, and it's us versus the world. And that means that the political dynamic shifts. It's no longer about partnering with like-minded politicians on the other side of the aisle. It's about taking over everything. And if you don't get what you want, you decimate the other side and you take away everything until they have nothing left. And we see this kind of pettiness on both sides. This is not one party. This is pretty much all politicians playing this game these days because it's a very unpopular thing to agree with the other side in any way. It is us or it is them. And it's a sort of tribalism, really, isn't it? It's something that we see in politics and in regions and you know, states and countries, as I mentioned. But we see it in sports. This is something that we are drawn to where we support a team, even though our support doesn't really actually mean anything. It's a way for us to define ourselves and to have an other to face off against. And then we see it even in things like cultural phenomenon, like Pokemon, the Pokemon augmented reality game that everybody's playing on their phones right now, which immediately dates this episode probably. But it's a real crazy thing that everybody is playing very suddenly. And as soon as you reach a certain level, you choose your team. Are you going to be team red, team blue, team yellow? And this is something that then puts you in a situation where you have teammates who ostensibly believe something similar that you do, even if it's just a preferred color, chosen spur of the moment. But then you also have enemies. These are people who are not on your team. And so as a result, there is an immediate consequence in the way we interact with each other when we are playing on this, in this case, literal playing field. But why do we do this? Like, what are, what are the benefits of this tribing up it's something that we are clearly drawn to. It's something that we're somewhat predisposed to, probably, or at least our social system is. But why? What's the benefit? Well, it does tend to emphasize what a particular group of people stand for and consider to be important. And so when you're able to apply a label to yourself or a label to your beliefs or a label to you and this group of people that you largely agree about things with, then it emphasizes to everybody else that this is a movement. It takes these things that maybe you believed on a personal level and turns them into revolutionary ideas. It turns them into a movement rather than just individually held beliefs. It also helps people feel like they're a part of something bigger. Being on a team, cheering for the right team even, even if you're not on the team, having a particular candidate or having a particular political party. That's something that allows you to get caught up in a wave of enthusiasm and also a wave of disdain against the other person or the other team. And that makes you part of something bigger. And there is or does tend to be a built-in desire to be part of something bigger than ourselves that we see in a lot of our actions, whether we immediately recognize them as that or not. Tribalism is also something that allows a person to feel pride in where they're from or who, or what, or what ideas they're associated with. And then there's a kind of psychological security that comes from being surrounded by people who believe the same thing that you do. I find that very often people who are maybe religious or people who are very strong believers in a particular political ideology, just being around somebody who believes differently than them can come across as a threat. And so they feel the need to change their mind or tell them that they're wrong or prove to themselves that this other person is wrong because the idea that somebody believes something other than us makes us subconsciously even question ourselves and question whether we've made the right choice. It's the same with brands even. If you bought a particular brand of phone and you see somebody else prefers another brand, 
you almost feel the need to like convert them to your side, to your particular brand of phone, or at least somehow convince yourself that you've made the right choice and they've made the wrong choice. And so being surrounded by people who believe the same as you, who vote the same as you, who have the same ideas about the afterlife, who have the same brand of phone, that type of tribing up makes a lot of sense. It makes us a lot more comfortable with our choices, as if we've made the obvious clear choice because everybody in our peer group has made the same choice. There are some benefits associated with having people in your peer group succeed because then you almost get to feel like it is in part your victory when they have a victory and they toward you. This is the type of thing that allows us to feel good when our sports team succeeds even though we were not playing on that team and likewise allows us to feel great when our candidate wins an election even though we ourselves were probably not directly involved in any meaningful way. Because of wonderful sociological predispositions like groupthink and the bandwagon effect and herd behavior, when we're part of a group, we tend to shortcut our thinking processes. A good way to explain this is that if you belong to a particular political party, then you'll probably, and I say probably because statistically this tends to be the case, you will probably vote straight ticket, which means that you vote for everybody who is currently up for election, all of the different races that you're voting for. You will vote for everybody from your party rather than splitting the ticket and voting for a few people from the other party and a few people from your party, a few people from the third party, whatever. Most people don't do that. And so being part of these groups, that groupthink, bandwagon, herd behavior thing, allows you to shortcut certain decision processes like that, where you just know that even if I don't necessarily agree with all of these politicians on every tiny little detail, chances are I agree with them on most things because my peer group that I strongly believe in, and by which I, in part at least, define myself, has told me that this is the right candidate. These are our candidates, whether or not I agree with them in every particular. And so we do tend to shortcut our thinking, and largely without negative consequence, because again, this is us being part of a group and that group specializing, and as a result, we don't need to think quite so hard in a lot of cases. And so you can perceive that as a benefit of tribalism, absolutely. But there's a lot of downsides to this, too. A significant number of downsides, I would argue. I, I would argue that they far outweigh the benefits of tribalism, particularly in the long term. By upping that contrast and eliminating the grays between the black and the white, we tend to emphasize differences between the groups at the expense of the similarities. And so rather than looking at that other group and saying, here's what we have in common, Instead, our predisposition tends to be to look at them and just notice all the things that they do different than us, rather than looking at that person who has a different brand phone than us and noticing all the cool things that that phone does that our phone also does. We recognize all the stupid things that it does, all the little UI gesture-based things that it does worse than us. And part of that is that we tend to flatten the details when we look at other groups of people. When we look at other ideologies, when we look at other brand preferences, we tend to succumb to what's known as essentialism, which is a tendency to categorize people and things according to what we see as being their essential nature, in spite of the many variations between these people. And so if we are a Democrat here in the United States, when we look at Republicans, we tend to see them all as pretty much the same, rather than seeing the many differences between people who call themselves Republicans. Whereas when we look at other Democrats, we tend to see the rich variety of people that tend to be part of our same party, because we allow ourselves to see those differences and not feel threatened by them. Whereas looking at these groups, these others, at a distance... It's the same as looking at anything from a distance. We tend to lose the detail. We tend to lose the context. We can't see the three-dimensionality of the thing quite so well because of that psychological distance between us and them. And that us versus them is part of the problem as well. The idea that other groups are necessarily, in a lot of cases, going to be at odds with us that we are going to be engaged in a lot of zero-sum situations, meaning it's us or them. Like, both of us can't win. We cannot create a situation where we all walk away happy. We're just way too different. 
if it's us versus them, I'm going to want us to win. And as a result, we tend to be almost always on the offensive, or at least on the defensive, in some way combative against this group of others, this group of people that we have reduced to caricatures and this group of people that we don't see the differences between, but we do see the differences between them and us. And so that tends to put us at each other's throats when we need not be. There's also the internalized byproduct of this, which is the potential for intellectual dissonance when one's own ideals don't fit neatly within one's group beliefs. That is to say, if you are a part of a religion that believes certain things about marriage, let's say, you should be married at a certain age. That's the correct thing to do, let's say. And you don't believe that. You do not believe that that is correct and you don't want to do it and it just does not make sense to you. But you strongly believe in everything else that the religion says and you strongly associate yourself as part of this religion. It's part of how you define yourself. That's going to cause some intellectual dissonance because, like, are you then wrong? Are you evil in some way? Are you flawed? Are you a sinner? Are you not as much a part of this group as you thought you were? This thing that you've defined yourself by for so long? Is this something that you don't actually adhere to or believe in? Are all of your other beliefs incorrect? Do you even know yourself? Do you know who you are? There's a real domino effect that can expand outward from this. And anybody who's been part of a group only to find that they don't completely agree with it 100% can attest, which I would guess is most of us with some group that we've been a part of, if we're being honest with ourselves at some point in our lives, it, it can cause a little bit of conflict, not just with other people either. Internal conflict where you begin to question everything and feel really insecure potentially for the better long term, but in a lot of cases it can be very, very harmful to have this incredibly well-defined tribe around you and then to have you not feel 100% like you're part of it or like you deserve it or like you belong there. Now because of this dissonance, or to try to alleviate it in some cases, I think, we also tend to flatten who we are. We flatten ourselves to fit better with inside this group so that more people can feel like they're a part of it. If, if too many of us have too many different ideas or too many different idiosyncrasies or individual attributes, then we don't fit underneath the same shape very well. Whereas if we can trim off some sharp edges here and there, then we can all kind of fit under this really boring kind of nebulous shape, but we'll all fit under it pretty well. And so by strongly associating ourselves with these tribes, with these groups, we lose a part of who we are typically over time because we adjust ourselves and sand down our rough edges so that we can feel like we are a more purified, refined version of whoever we think we are within this tribe. In addition to changing ourselves so that we can become closer to this ideologically pure version of who we think we should be, there's the ever-increasing danger of the filter bubble, which is something I've mentioned on another episode, maybe two other episodes. But the idea here is that when we are surrounded by people who agree with us in every particular or almost every particular, then we tend to have an outsized idea of what people in general think. And we tend to think that we have the correct answers because we agree with essentially everybody that we come into contact with. This reinforces certain ideas that maybe shouldn't be reinforced, but it also keeps us from imagining how things might be outside of this small group of people and their small group of shared values and ideas. This is an influence that is becoming more and more powerful with the advent of social media and algorithmic news feeds. When you go on Facebook, you're not seeing everything that's posted by everybody that you follow or that you're friends with. You are seeing what Facebook's algorithms has decided will keep you most engaged. And in a lot of cases, what that means is things that will make you click like and share. So that means what it will do is filter through everything that's being posted of all available potential media and then sharing with you the things that it thinks you will like the most. This creates a digital filter bubble so that all you're seeing are the news items that agree with you or that reinforce pre-existing ideas. You're seeing comments by people that you tend to agree with about things that you tend to agree with. 
And as a result, that idea that you have the correct answers and that everybody agrees with you is amplified, when, in all likelihood, that couldn't be further from the truth. These same algorithms and filters tend to make us fall prey to what's called group attribution error, which essentially means that we look at the actions or preferences of one person in a given group or tribe and assume that that is reflective of the ideas or actions or preferences of the entire group. And so using U.S. politics as an example again, it would mean a Republican seeing a post from a Democrat and then based on that one post, assuming that's what all Democrats think about that given topic. This is unfortunately all too common because, again, we are fed things that make us interact. And if we are more likely to get outraged at a particular type of news or a particular opinion, we'll get fed those sometimes so that we rage share them with our friends and then they rage share and that domino effect just continues unabated. This is very, very good for social networks, which make money the more you interact, but it's not so great for people who are falling prey to ideological stereotyping. Now, I'm leaving a bunch of things out, but I, I think it makes sense to jump to the most destructive long-term consequence of this tribalism here, and that is that it establishes a paradigm, which is a, like a, a pattern or a model of seeing the world, which leaves us open to what's called the Semmelweis reflex, which is the tendency to reject new evidence that contradicts our existing paradigm contradicts our existing way of seeing the world or the model that we use to understand the world. And so what that means is that the more we tribe up and the more we distort our view of ourselves and our group, but also of the other and their group, the more likely we are to reject any information, any data that goes against or contradicts that point of view that we have. And so if I believe that all atheists are devil worshipers for some reason, then any data that comes my way that says, no, atheists are not devil worshipers, that doesn't even make sense, I am more likely to reject it because it contradicts what I already, quote unquote, know to be true. When I learned this term, and I think you'll find the same, I found it to be all too perfect. It describes exactly what's going on with most of us, most of the time, with almost everything. The more filtered our news is and the more the world orients itself to make us comfortable and entertained and exposes us to things that it knows we will enjoy, the more likely we are to be made very uncomfortable when we're exposed to something different. It's very uncomfortable for a Democrat to watch Fox News. And it's equally uncomfortable for a Republican to read the Huffington Post. It's not just because these are things that these two different people disagree with. It's because they are being given information that slants a different way than all of the information they get in the rest of their life for the rest of their day. It is information that contradicts directly the reality that they perceive the framework upon which their entire world is built. It would be like if you spent your entire life looking at the leaves on the trees and calling that color green, and then somebody comes up to you randomly someday and tells you, no, that's purple. It creates kind of a cognitive dissonance, doesn't it? Like the idea that, well, first of all, who is this crazy person telling me this fact that couldn't possibly be true? Trust me, I know what color this leaf is. It's green. And this idiot is telling me that it's purple. It's a weird thing and it's a somewhat uncomfortable thing when somebody comes to you with this information that you can't possibly believe because it doesn't fit into your framework of how the world works. And yet they seem so certain of it. And that's what makes it uncomfortable. That it makes clear that there are people out there operating within a completely different framework living entirely different realities. They are seeing the same things that you're seeing and coming to different conclusions about it. They're looking at the same leaf and using a different word for the color of that leaf than you would. 
And so pulling this back around, we are seeing the consequences of this now. The reason the Brexit passed is the same reason that Donald Trump, during the U.S. presidential election, is seeing such immense support when all of the experts in the field thought that there was no possible way that he would get past the primaries. There is an amplification of extremes that was not happening before. And so all of those voices in the rural UK that would have once had very different ideologies, even though maybe perhaps further right or left than other people in the country, they're suddenly being pushed far out to the extremes of the spectrum rather than existing in the comfy, soft, somewhat blurry gray zone in between. And the same is true in the US. The same is true throughout countries in Europe. We're seeing these incredibly extreme voices on all sides. This is not a one party or a one belief system thing. This is happening to everybody. We're seeing amplifications of all of these messages, and we're seeing more refined, purified versions of everything. And as a result, we're missing out on temperate, moderate, in between, hybrid voices that we used to have, but that we are starting to see less and less of. And when we do see them, we tend not to listen because their ideas, again, even though some of them, sync up with the realities that we perceive. In some cases, they'll say something that we think is just as crazy as them calling a leaf purple, because that's simply not the way that we see the world. So why should we listen to them? There are still things that balance the extremes out a little bit and bring back some of those gray tones in the middle between black and white. Fine art, for example, is, is something that's really, really valuable in this endeavor. Whether you're watching a ballet performance or looking at a painting or reading a work of fiction, interacting with and experiencing art increases one's potential for empathy. It allows you to see something of what somebody else sees, see the composer or the dancer out there performing the ballet, or to see the opinion of the painter or their point of view or their perception of something, to figure out what the world might look like, or to see through somebody else's eyes temporarily by reading a novel. These are incredibly valuable things as long as you allow them to be. And there's nothing wrong with just reading for entertainment or watching TV for entertainment. But I would argue that these are incredibly valuable tools if we allow ourselves to see them that way and allow ourselves not just to passively take them in but instead to recognize what they're telling us and what they're showing us about these different standpoints and about these people who are in different tribes than us and how they see the world and to take it very seriously. Even if they're telling us that a leaf is purple, trying to understand why they would think that and where that might have come from and what it might mean for our perception that the leaf is green. There's also a lot to be said for representatives of these different groups who cross over into that no-man's land in between the well-established, well-defended, tribal, black-and-white extremes. Sometimes these people take a lot of heat for a lot of different reasons, but you, you look at somebody like Caitlyn Jenner, who represents the trans community, and she is not the first trans person to have ever done anything or to be famous or to really stand up for who she is and what she's doing and help build awareness of the trans community. And so that rubs some people the wrong way. But at the same time, it's undeniable that bringing attention to that community is incredibly valuable and bringing attention to the concerns of that community and the way they're treated in some cases. That, despite the downsides, I would argue, is an incredibly valuable thing. These bridge personalities, despite the fact that they are very seldom the best possible representative of their group, the fact that they are a representative that is getting noticed for whatever reason, and as a result, able to build that empathy with other people who may not recognize their concerns and preferences and point of view, that, I think, is very worthwhile. It's a very worthwhile thing to aspire to, but it's also something very worthwhile to support in most cases. Unfortunately, a lot of people benefit from eliminating these grays. Even if we might want to see more of that grayscale in between the extremes, that doesn't mean that certain forces will make it easy for that to happen. It is much easier to organize and instruct 
and control people when they are put into very well-organized, manageable groups. When they've lost some of their personal identity and believe themselves to be part of a group so strongly that if you tell them that group does this thing, they will do it, whether or not they actually believe it. That is a very valuable thing for somebody who wants to be in control. Very often, this type of tribalism results in our being led by our emotions more often than logic. If we were calm and cold and rational about a lot of this, we wouldn't necessarily need all of the benefits of being part of a tribe, at least not so often and not in such a way that we lost so much of ourselves to be part of that group. And as a result, to be part of that group, we, we tend to get a little bit overwhelmed by emotion more easily. And again, this is something that you can see pretty much everywhere if you begin to look at it, if you begin to look at the diehards in any political entity or any religious group or any whatever, any of these extreme tribes, sports teams, any of the diehard fans. These are not people who are acting rationally. They, they are acting emotionally because they are part of this group and enjoying it and feeling the benefits of that. And that is an upside that becomes a downside on scale. And it also becomes a little bit easier to control people in that you can shame them when they associate strongly with a group. What I mean by that is that when part of your self-definition and part of your personality becomes wrapped up in a certain group, it's very, very easy to control that person by telling them that they are not good enough or that they're not part of that group enough or not Christian enough, not Democrat enough, not a good enough Green Bay Packers fan, you know, whatever it happens to be. It's much easier to degrade somebody when you have that yardstick to measure them with and you have this yardstick that they want to measure up to, but because you kind of control the yardstick, it's, it's much easier to make them fall into line if you want them to than it would be if it was their individual traits that you were trying to control them with. I'm not trying to make the argument that the middle ground between everything is always the answer. I, I don't think that. I don't think that right in the middle of black and white is the perfect shade of gray. And, and I don't even think necessarily that extremes are always incorrect in every particular there's actually a logical fallacy called the argument to moderation that I try to avoid because I do try to encourage people and try to really work on this myself as well to stay flexible in my thinking because that allows me then to pick and choose as rationally as possible between things when they make sense to me and my background and, and everything that, that I tend to believe as a result of that. And sometimes that means I have a very extreme idea about something. And in a lot of cases, it means that instead of being a one or a 10, I'm like a three or like a seven or maybe a five or a six. Like I could be anywhere on the scale. And so the extremes are legitimate options as well. It's just important that we don't decide that those are either the default or the only options that we have, even when people tend to tell us or imply at least that that's the case. I would say in particular, when you're finding yourself being encouraged to look down upon an other, somebody from another group, look very closely at the person who's doing the encouraging. And chances are they're going to be somebody who benefits from that, who is using the group that you are a part of to control you, to use you as a weapon against somebody else or some other group. A politician will find you easier to convince if you identify as being part of the group that they lead or want to lead. A business owner or brand ambassador will benefit if you identify as the type of person who uses their product and are therefore more loyal to their brand, regardless of how well that brand does by you. A religious leader or a spiritual leader or a philosopher of some flavor might gain popularity for their ideals by encouraging you to come be a part of their flock, which will increase the size of their herd. And as that grows, they gain more influence. In short, there's a lot of ways that people can manipulate you by using your emotions and using your dedication and your loyalty to certain groups against you. And so when somebody is encouraging you to do that, encouraging you to look down on the other without questioning, without thinking it through yourself, Look very closely at them and 
figure out what they're trying to accomplish, and then maybe question why you are allowing them to have this power over you, if you are allowing to, them to have this power over you. Although they're not always the answer or the place that everybody wants to stand, these gray zones are really what allow for tolerance. Because if we're able to bend, move away from our extreme views on things, then that means we're also allowing other people to have different views from us and being okay with that. And that's what allows us as humans, as thinking sentient creatures, to interact with each other and deal with each other and not be killing each other all the time because of a disagreement or having different opinions on the color of that leaf or the right way to pray or whatever. This is what allows us to interact, to build a global, species-wide civilization. Setting aside these absolutes gives us the ability to overlap and to benefit, frankly, from all of our differences, rather than having those differences become the prickly points that stay between us forever. Focusing on these similarities, then, rather than the differences, Nationalism, patriotism, brand loyalty, party loyalty, religious or spiritual dogmatism, these things force us toward extremes and thicken the lines, the borders that are drawn between us and which define us. And these lines, these borders can become so thick that they become uncrossable at a certain point. So it's important that we try to keep them malleable if we're able to recognize the value of the gray areas, even if we don't spend all of our time there, to at least go explore, to go dabble, to see what it looks like, and to try to put ourselves in other people's shoes from time to time. Now, as a result of everything that's happening right now, the filter bubbles and the amplification of extremes, I can understand why not everyone believes that grays even exist. And even in acknowledging the value of these things, the value of flexibility, the value of certain types of tolerance and the value of being able to empathize and explore these gray spaces between ideological extremes, I still don't know if it's possible to slow down what's happening or to try to push it back in the opposite direction toward a more relative, flexible, less well-outlined, less black and white and contrasty situation. But I do know that I want to believe thank you so much for listening if you'd like to help support the show and the continued production of the show you can subscribe if you're not already subscribed and you can leave a review on itunes or wherever you get your podcasts there are several ways that you can contribute to the show monetarily. You can give a dollar a show. You can do that through letsknowthings.com. There are several links there that will allow you to go to PayPal or Venmo, whatever is most convenient for you. That is very much appreciated, as is purchasing one of my books. And you can find the full list of books that I have written at colin.io. If you like this project, you might also like my other projects. I have a blog, which can be found at exilelifestyle.com. And I have a YouTube show, which can be found at considerthis.io, or just search for Colin Wright or Consider This on YouTube. There is a Let's Know Things newsletter, which you can find and subscribe to at letsknowthings.com. There is a Let's Know Things Facebook page, which you can find by searching for Let's Know Things. And you can find me, my, my individual social media channels, pretty much everywhere at Colin is my name. As per the usual, there will be a new episode next week. And then I'm trying something else this week where I'm going to be doing an interstitial episode in between where I will answer some questions and I will talk about the show and the project itself things that wouldn't typically fit in the normal show format. So there will be a little update coming in the next few days. Thanks again for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again very soon. Mm -hmm.